Good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever this newscast that you will never hear on TV will hit your ears. I hope you are all doing well. So lots of crazy stuff went on Monday. Um, I worked 14 hours plus drive time, and so I am making this video absolutely late. Anyway... There was a lot going on in Jerusalem. Not sure if everyone's heard about it, that the Alaska Mosque was basically almost burnt down in flames because the Palestinians firing fireworks at Israelis as massive escalations of arguing, fighting, and violence took place on the Temple Mount. Um... I almost wondered if the Alaska Moss was going to burn to the ground and this was going to be it. Oh man, it just flashed right across my head. And I was like, we are so close to the third temple being built. And one of my earlier conclusions when I first came to Bible prophecy back around 2007 and 8 was that, yeah, it's it's just got to be removed from the site because that's where they're going to start building um, the temple. But so much news going on anymore, folks. It's really hard to keep track of it. So massive rocket barrage into Ashkelon leaves six wounded, six Israeli wounded, as Hamas launched its massive rocket barrage on Ashkelon. Netanyahu says that Hamas is going to be very sorry that he did this. So the assault came after a night of almost constant rocket fire on Israeli communities near the Gaza Strip. And as the Israeli Defense Forces conducted strikes on some 130 targets on the coastal enclave, it followed the day which saw a major outbreak of violence from Gaza, including rare rocket fire. And according to the Middle East Eye, later in the night... There were reports of the Alaska Mosque not having received any blemishes, that there was no damage done to the mosque itself, but several trees within that courtyard did burn up. Along with all of this crazy stuff going on in Israel, Syria at the Golan Heights, remember I have always told you to watch the Golan Heights. It could be the very key to setting off Isaiah 17, where Damascus will cease to be the oldest continuous living city in all of the earth. So Israeli helicopters struck targets in the Syrian Golan Heights. This was a UK-based observer group reports that three people were wounded in this strike, which targeted Syrian military positions that also hosted Hezbollah units. So watching the escalations happen all over Israel and into Syria, out of this comes on Friday, uh, which the news came out on Sunday, two longtime bitter enemies who have for much of the past couple decades battled for influence in the Middle East while clashing through proxies, have entered unlikely secret talks. On Friday, the Saudi foreign ministry official confirmed previously widespread rumors of the past weeks that the kingdom is in communications with Iran in order to reduce regional tensions. Um, it's, it's suggested that these secret talks took place in Baghdad, uh, the Saudi minister ambassador, Raid Krimli, told Reuters, we hope they prove successful, but it is too early and premature to reach any definitive conclusions. Can anyone say Psalms 83? Also, the Saudis are not only reaching out to Iran at this time, but also they have gone to the Assad government in Damascus, Earlier in last week on Tuesday, multiple international reports revealed that Saudi Arabia's powerful intelligence chief traveled to Damascus last Monday to meet with his Syrian counterpart in what was seen as a major step toward 
detente. The two broke off relations since near the start of the war in 2011, especially as it became clear that the Saudis were the key part of the Western allied push for regime change. So this is taking a turn, folks. I do want to remind everybody about the prophecy found in Psalms 83. Do you remember way back when, I believe it was 2006, Uh, Some construction workers were working in an Irish bog and found one of the oldest found Bibles, and it was open to Psalms 83, and it was hundreds of years old, found kept perfectly in this bog. And so everybody started to wonder what this was all about. I think we're seeing that the final fulfillments of these as we watch people starting to you know, people groups like Iran, uh, the Sunnis and Muslims, Sunnis and Shias, um, they're starting to come together and form bonds, form coalitions. And as we also see Turkey calling uh, Israel a terrorist state, Erdogan said on Saturday called Israel a cruel terrorist state as Turkish media called to free al Aska and Jerusalem, just like he reconsecrated the historic church of Haggai Sophia as a mosque last year. Writing in Turkish, Erdogan said he invites the whole world, especially the Islamic countries, to take effective action against Israel's attack on the mosque, Jerusalem, and Palestinian homes. Unfortunately, many of these people do not believe in the one true God, Yahweh, and his son, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. And what God the Father has told us is that Israel's borders are going to be increased and she will gain pretty much massive power here um, right before Ezekiel 38 and 39 comes to pass, and that will be the time of Gog coming from the land of Magog. Moving away from the Middle East, back to good old U.S. of A. That's falling apart at the seams. The U.S. has now declared a state of emergency to keep gasoline flowing after the Colonial fails to restart its hacked pipeline. So the U.S. government declared the state of emergency late on Sunday, lifting limits on the transport of fuels by road in a bid to keep gas supplies line open as fears of shortage spiked after its continued shutdown of the Colonial Pipeline. And now moving into Monday, gas runs have already begun as fuel stations run dry amid the hacked pipeline. Some gas stations are completely out of supply. Do you guys remember the 70s when this like totally happened and gas became rationed? Oh, just imagine how how much of a heyday the Great Reset people um, are going to love this because they can just now dole out whatever they want little bitty amounts to you. And yes, you you can't go that far to work. Uh, you got to find a job closer to home. And, and, and sorry that you live out in the boonies, but figure it out. I could see this becoming a thing very quickly. Speaking of the great reset, diabolical people... Klaus Schwab calls for global health pass based on implantable microchip. Um, Bill Gates, hmm, what a story we're going to get into there. And other globalists used MIT and other universities to develop these systems, but when the public resists this Orwellian takeover, they denounce it as a conspiracy theory, the ultimate form of gaslighting. So... Back in 2016, he did an interview, uh, which has now gained national attention because everybody's finally realizing that maybe the Mark of the Beast isn't a fairy tale. Uh, He basically explained at that interview that within a decade, humanity will be required to have implantable microchips to serve as a global health pass. The interviewer asked Schwab in French, we are talking about chips that can be implanted. When will that be? 
And Schwab responded, certainly in the next 10 years. And at first, we will implant them in our clothes. And then we could imagine then that we will implant them in our brains and in our skin. So Schwab went even further in this interview, describing the globalist transhumanist dream of direct fusion of consciousness to the digital world. And in the end, maybe there will be a direct communication between the brains and the digital world, a kind of a fusion of the physical, digital, and biological world. Um, he basically said he insists that people will soon be able to simply say, I want to be connected with anyone right now. And so this creating a digital mark of the beast is one of the key tenets of the Great Reset, which is in progress, which describes reshaping the global economy to consolidate power for the New World Order or Luciferian system that is being set up right now to fight against our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach, at Armageddon. Folks, this is happening right before your eyes. Bible prophecy is coming to life. And it's further ado with false Biden. A new proposal by the Biden administration to create a health-focused federal agency modeled after DARPA is not what it appears to be. Promoted as a way to end cancer, this resuscitated health DARPA conceals a dangerous agenda. So last Wednesday, Biden was widely praised um, in the mainstream Jokia and healthcare-focused media for his call to create a new biomedical research agency modeled after the U.S. military's high-risk, high-reward DARPA, as touted by the president. The agency would seek to develop innovative and breakthrough treatments for cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and diabetes with a call to end cancer as we know it, giving the NIH basically the budget of over $51 billion. They're going to uh, steer DARPA and ARPA-H um, in this direction. So ARPA-H will likely be heavily funded and promote mRNA VACs as one of the breakthroughs that will cure cancer. Some of these uh, gene therapy VAC manufacturers that have produced some of the most widely used CV19 VACs, such as Pfizer and BioNTech, uh, stated last month that cancer is the next problem to tackle with the mRNA um, post COVID, which is very interesting. Um, so these therapies for cancer for years and has collaborated with, again, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to create this mRNA-based treatments for not only cancer, but tuberculosis and HIV. Not only is this entire initiative being set up with HARPA under the watchful eye of DARPA, um, they're co-mingling such things as Safe Home, um, Fitbits, Amazon Echo, Google Home, all the Apple Watches, um, all of the AI algorithms that you're wearing on your body or that's in your home or in your car. All of this is being funneled into one mind. I call this the beast. Um, the Department of Justice pre-crime approach known as DEEP that was activated just months before Trump left office. Um, it's also a justified way to stop mass shootings before they happen. They're going to start making pre-crime arrests and warrantless surveillance. And this newly announced agency, if approved by Congress, of course it will be because it's run by Democrats, demon rats, I'm sorry, would integrate these post Obama era initiatives with Orwellian applications under one roof. This is the beast system kicking on. Um, it will have less oversight than it ever had before. People will be able to do exactly what they want. If HARPA, ARPA-H 
is approved by Congress and ultimately established, it will be used to resurrect dangerous and long-standing agendas of the national security state and its Silicon Valley contractors creating a digital dictatorship that threatens human freedom, human society, and potentially the very definition of what it means to be a human being. And moving on to some very interesting articles that should really catch your attention. Um, Because this new world order, this Luciferian bestial system is getting set up, and it's all being touted under this great reset. It's not a conspiracy. It is a reality. It is already happening. Among all of this, we know is going to come to pass because we've read our Bibles, right, folks? We've read the book of Revelation. And even though it is kind of a confusing book with all the symbolism and uh, events in there that are so far advanced ahead, that we haven't quite seen all of the little trigger points yet, but we know that some things are undeniable and Christians are going to start losing their heads after the three and a half year. Um, Basically, I think it's going to be just a little bit before the three and a half year mark, but it's really going to get going uh, super much once the Antichrist has unwielding power, unyielding power for 42 months where the vials of the Lord will be poured out. We can watch this all taking place right now. Um, Some articles here, pastor claims Democrats are absolutely pushing out Christianity to embrace socialist agenda. The national syndicated radio host Todd Starnes pointed out that instead, the Democrat president called on Americans to use prayer to fight racial injustice and climate change. The problem with the Democrats is that they don't believe that we are endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights, Starnes said in his commentary last Thursday. They believe we are endowed by the government. Jeffrey said he wasn't shocked by Biden's statement. It's just unbelievable, he told Starnes. When President Trump was in the Oval Office, we used to go up every year for the National Day of Prayer, and Biden canceled that. Um, Other ones think it can't happen here in America. Watch this. Finnish leader just quoted from the Bible and now he's facing jail time. This is a Finnish leader. Quoting the Bible can't land you in American prison yet, but in Helsinki, It's a different story. In case that stunned the West, Finland's former interior minister and leader of a Christian Democrats has been criminally charged for posting a picture of the Bible opens to Romans chapter 1 verses 24 through 27. She was disturbed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church joining a gay pride event and decided to remind them what God said about homosexuality. Now, after a two-year investigation, the tweet can put her behind bars. So remember, also in this unique news story, (laughs) I posted a video on my alternative channels Uh, It's called Get Out, and you can look for them uh, at your own discretion. But it's about this Canadian pastor that was arrested for continuing his church services. So two days ago, he and his brother were arrested for defying state orders by having a church service that didn't conform to local health standards. Pawlowski set off the Internet firestorm with his passionate defense of liberty he forcefully resisted the intrusion i'm not interested in listening to you you are nazis communist brown shirts and you are not welcome here um folks they came back and they actually arrested him on the highway him and his brother and another article from natural news praying to god could be made a crime can you believe it Lawmakers are threatened with legal action. 
The Christian Institute in the UK revealed this week it will take legal action if lawmakers go ahead with a strategy to ban conversation therapy. I I don't even know what this is. I had to look it up. That would impact most churches, missions, ministries, and even praying to God. Jason Koppel, QC, wrote in a detailed legal opinion for the faith organization that activists who are proposing new definitions in law to address their fears of conversion therapy would criminalize the ordinary work of churches. Activists claim so-called conversion therapy is an orchestrated strategy to persuade homosexual individuals to leave that lifestyle and become straight. But often it's counseling that is in response to an individual's own desire to rid themselves of unwanted same-sex attraction. So Koppel warned that prayer, evangelism, church membership, baptism, and communion could all breach a broad conversion therapy law like the one recently passed in Victoria, Australia. Churches that follow the Bible's teachings on gender and sexuality were targeted recently in a debate in the British Parliament over legislation that would ban so-called conversion therapy. So Member of Parliament Alicia Kearns dismissed concerns over the impact of such a ban on freedom of religion expression. Uh, Basically, she told her colleagues, religious liberty is fundamental, but so too is people's liberty to live their lives free from identity-based violence and abuse. So basically, Kearns insists that any prayer inconsistent with LGBT theology should be banned. This is total rejection of the Christian religion of Yahweh, our Father in Heaven, and His Son, and the good news of the Bible, which is the coming kingdom of God. Folks, they want this out of people's minds. They don't want people knowing that He's coming. They don't want to know anything about Him. So we know that these things are all moving forward very quickly. Um, Please realize that you're not alone. If you listen to these newscasts and it makes you very depressed and down and sad, um, I would ask that you continue to listen to the news and to watch where it's going. Be a watcher. But remember that the kingdom of God is so much more joyful and loving and it's coming so soon, folks. Our time here on this earth is going to be very quick and very brief. And then we get to live all eternity with our God, our Savior, our loved one. And we'll never be separated again from the ones we truly love. And just keep in mind that this is just a brief craziness that all the world has got to go through. God saw the end from the beginning And he's coming with it all through all this mess. He's right there with us walking through it. So last article, don't make this dismayed. Instead of feeling depressed and oppressed, move your energies towards doing something about it. If you need to save money to buy food and put it away in a little corner of your place of residence, do so now. What will you do when inflation forces U.S. households to spend 40% of their incomes on food? Did you know that the price of corn has risen 142% in the last 12 months? Of course, corn is used in hundreds of different products we buy at the grocery store, and so everyone is going to feel the pain of this price increase. But it isn't just the price of corn that's going crazy. We are seeing food prices shoot up dramatically all across the industry. So if you think that those prices are bad now, just wait. It is going to get worse. So just to give you an example, in 2019, Americans spent an average of 9 5% of their disposable personal income on food. And between 1960 and 1998, the 
average share of that disposable personal income spent on total food was, it fell from an average of 17% to 10.1%, driven by a declining share in income spent on food at home. So now, needless to say, the poorest Americans spend most of their income on food Basically, they were spending at the end of 2019 and into 2020 was an average of 36% of income on food. And so the final numbers for 2020 are going to be a bit higher. And many believe that eventually the percentage of disposable personal income that the household spends on food will reach 40 So that's 40% of just your food to keep you and your family alive. Now let's add in the gas problem and how gas is rising. And now we've had cyber attacks on gas. You can't get it. Now it's both going to be unattainable and expensive if you can get it. Folks, it's crazy. Like $100 means nothing anymore in this economy because inflation is coming to take it all away. And this is their plan. By 2030, you will own nothing and you will be happy. That is their mantra. So whatever you do um, in the next coming months, make sure that you are stocking up on those foods that you know will be non-perishable. A lot of things such as beef and your meats, They can be canned, uh, they can be frozen. Make sure that you are doing a vacuum pack sealer or butcher paper, you know, make sure that you're preventing uh, freezer burn from destroying that meat. But invest in a deep freezer if you can. Um, Find other ways to preserve meat and to preserve those foods uh, that you do enjoy. And grow a garden, grow a victory garden this year. Make sure you're planting as many things as you possibly can on your porches, on your balconies. My balcony is pretty much going to be almost full um, by the time the start of summer happens. (laughs) And another thing I would like to add is wherever you live, I can can almost foresee that this... uh, Grand solar minimum is going to start making its impact felt. Um, We felt it last year where there was a lot of rain here in Alaska. And I had locals actually tell me that this was normal. This is kind of how it's supposed to be in Alaska. It's really moist and rainy and, and cooler. You know, the highs of 75 were about as high it got. Uh, The first year we came here, oh my gosh, I thought I was going to die. It almost got up to 98 degrees here. Anyway, um, I expect that these years, now that we are into the grand solar minimum, are going to be much cooler. So think about your seed selection. Go to Baker Seeds Heirloom. Go to other people's seed sites that tell you that these are cold weather crops. Like I've gotten an heirloom variety of cabbage I am growing. I already have like 20 plants of it growing and it's been about 55 degrees in my house at points and they're thriving. They're doing great. I have nice, strong, healthy plants. So think about where you're living. Think about it being a little bit colder that year and can your plants make it? Can you grow those? So tomatoes, they need hot, hot sun. Peppers need hot, hot sun. You may need to purchase some uh, some six mil uh, greenhouse plastic to put over your balconies or your areas where you live and keep that cold off of those heat loving plants. So think outside the box, folks. But remember, out of all these things, uh, don't, don't be sad. Be glad because our Lord and Savior is raised back from the dead. He was resurrected and is sitting at the right hand of the Father in heaven. I have been addressing over the last several newscasts um, of a very important book that I have been reading. 
called Kingdom Principles by Dr. Miles Monroe. Unfortunately, him and his family were killed in an airplane accident. And this book is very precious because he spent most of his evangelical life, if he'd still have been alive today, he probably would have been one of the great um, evangelists like Perry Stone and um, Billy Graham, you know, some of these other ones, because um, even though this pastor uh, was out of the Bahamas, things that you're talking about in this book, and it's 224 pages, so it's an easy read, is just phenomenal for someone who is stepping outside of church, basically um, the whole mantra of the modern Christian age is just say this prayer and you'll be saved. But there's so much more in depth into what it means to be redeemed from this earth and to become a part of Yahweh and Yeshua's fold, specifically Yeshua's fold. Um, Kingdom Principles tells you from bottom up what it looks like to live in a kingdom and how it's going to kind of operate. So I'm really breaking it down and giving you like little sections of it throughout these newscasts. But please go down in the link in the description box below and, and read this book thoroughly for yourself. It was quite phenomenal and I love it. I'm still not finished with it yet. But so come and join me on this journey through Kingdom Principles. God created the earth as a place over which to extend his influence, but he intended to do it through mankind, not himself. He designed man to be fit, a fit colonizer for the physical world. And this is why humans are so well suited physically for life in this world. The Bible says that Yahweh created man from the dust of the ground. Genesis 2 verse 7. Scientific evidence confirms this. Our bodies are made from the same stuff as the earth. Before God created us, he fashioned a physical world that would be perfect environment for us to fulfill our purpose and destiny. Then he formed our physical bodies from the same material. Man is a triune being just like his creator. We reflect his image even in our composition. Man is a spirit after the nature and essence of our source, Father God, Father Yahweh. He lives in a body which is his earth suit that allows him to relate to the physical environment and he possesses a soul which is his intellect, will, and emotional faculties. We are suited for the earth as perfectly as God is suited for heaven. Remember we had discussed earlier, um, probably a few newscasts ago, that in a kingdom, the land is the personal property of the king and the qualification and the foundation of kingship um, is established by the right full ownership of the land. So it is this ownership right that designates him as Lord. In a kingdom, when referring to a physical land, the territory is called crown land. This implies the land is property of the crown, referring to the king himself. By creative right, the earth is heaven's crown land. In a kingdom, all the land within the kingdom belongs to the king. Every square foot of territory it is his personal property, his king domain. In a true kingdom, therefore, there is no such thing as private property owned by the citizens. The king owns it all. And Yahweh, Father God, owns it all. And he basically delegates uh, authority and rule over territory uh, to certain vice regents or others who are given that right to rule and reign over those provinces and territories. So God owns the earth. Yahweh owns the earth and everything on it. The earth is his crown land. Even in Psalms 24 verses 1 and 2, it states the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. I heard uh, a while ago uh, some atheist 
uh, had been stating that I can create anything. Um, I think he was a scientist, uh, atheist. I can create anything I want. I can build a human being in a test tube and this and that. And somebody challenged him and says, well, can you make dirt? And he couldn't reply to it because no one can make something from nothing. And God actually can do that. So that's what makes him God. Because Yahweh owns the earth, he can do with it however he pleases. And it pleased him to give it to mankind. Again, the words of David, Psalms 115, verse 16, The highest heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to man. So when Yahweh gives the rights to rule and reign over territory or land, he's not giving away the land. The ownership is still belongs to the one who made it, uh, the creator. The crown land given to someone by the king remains crown land. At any time, the king can take it back and give it to someone else. That is the king's prerogative. So when God gave the earth to man, he did not relinquish ownership of it. We possess the earth as a trust, as stewards, as kings under the high king of heaven. The king gave us dominion over the earth, not as owners, but as vassal kings to ex extend his heavenly government to the earthly realm. He gave us rulership, not ownership. We have the privilege to rule the earth, and with that privilege also comes great responsibility of wisdom and righteous management. And we are accountable unto the king for how we manage our domain, his land. It is also on this prerogative of kingship and lordship that God could, without the permission of its current inhabitants, promise Abraham the land of Canaan as a birthright. A lot of people who deny the existence of Israel and say that Israel is trespassers and have an apartheid going on and this and that, uh, that land was and always will be Yahweh's. Same thing with the rest of the nations of the earth. All of it that you walk upon belongs to Yahweh, and he gives it to whom he chooses. So we see the understanding of crown land applying to the nation of Israel. This ancient Jewish law handed down through Moses stipulated that no property sales in Israel were permitted because the land belongs to God. Leviticus 25, verses 23 through 24, the land must not be sold permanently because the land is mine and you are but aliens and my tenants. Throughout the country that you hold as a possession, you must provide for the redemption of the land. Israelites were free to occupy their own plot of land, develop it, cultivate it, live off of it, and even pass it on to their heirs. They were not to sell it, however, especially to non-Israelites. If financial circumstances necessitated selling the property to a fellow Israelite, the law made provisions for the land to be returned. Every 50 years, Israel celebrates the year of Jubilee, during which time any land that had changed hands since the previous Jubilee year automatically reverted to the original possessor. In Israel today, the, the similar principle is in fact. When young couple in Israel marry, the Israeli government provides or assists them with their first house. Why? Because there is no private ownership of property in Israel. Officially, the land belongs to Yahweh. The principle here is that in a kingdom, living on and using the land is a privilege. It's not a right. This practice reflects a kingdom consciousness that we all need to cultivate. It is critical for our understanding of the kingdom and how it works. That's, we recognize the whole earth is heaven's crown land and that we are merely just strangers here on the earth, stewards of God's property. Yahweh never does anything to no purpose. From the very beginning, God's intent for the earth was that it be colonized. Isaiah, an ancient scribe and spokesman for the king, wrote in Isaiah 45, verse 18, He who created the heavens, he is God. He who fashioned and made the earth, he founded it. 
He did not create it to be empty, but formed it to be inhabited. Our presence on earth was a colonial decision by our king. He created this planet as new territory, fashioned us out of the same material, planted us here, and issued a colonial charter giving us dominion. We own nothing but have access to everything. As long as we operate within the parameters of the governing principles the king has established for his kingdom. This is what it means to be a colony of heaven. The concept of colonization is the most important component of a kingdom that we must understand or else it will be impossible to fully grasp the essence of the message of the Bible, the prophets, and the focus and priority of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. It is misunderstanding or ignorance of this concept, this kingdom concept, through colonization that has produced all human religions and sects. Christianity as a religion is itself a product of this misunderstanding. The primary purpose, motive, plan, and program of God the Creator was to colonize earth with heaven. Understanding the concept of colonization is key because once we understand what God intended, we will understand what God is doing. He put people on this earth for the purpose of expanding his influence and authority from the supernatural realm to the natural realm. A colony, by definition, is populated by people who originally came from another place. It is an outpost inhabited by citizens of a faraway country whose allegiance remains with their home government. Stated another way, a colony is a group of emigrants or their descendants who settle in a distant land but remain subject to the parent country. Colonization involves citizens of one country inhabiting foreign territory for the purpose of influencing that domain with the culture and values of their native country and governing it with the laws of their home government. For example, the message of Yeshua, as stated in his mission statement, recorded Matthew 4, verse 17, "...the kingdom of heaven has arrived." would indicate that the first colony of heaven had returned to the earth through him. As citizens of heaven, we inhabit the earth for the purpose to influence it with the culture and values of heaven and bring it under the government of the king of heaven. Yahweh's intent was to plant a colony of his citizens on the earth to make his manifold wisdom, his heart, mind, will, and desires known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. In other words, to the spirit world. His purpose in colonizing earth was to show the spiritual powers of darkness how beings created in his own image could be planted on the earth and bring in the government and culture of heaven so that in the end, the earth would look just like heaven. Most people, especially in the West, have never lived in a kingdom. The concept is completely foreign to many people, the majority of people. We simply do not know what it is like to live under a king. Uh, This might not be a problem were it not for the second reason for studying the kingdom, God's government, and the government of heaven is a kingdom and God is the king. And because his kingdom extends through all creation, encompassing both the supernatural and the natural realms, it covers us also, which is why we need to understand it. The critical reason to study this concept and restore it, um, the kingdom is because the Bible is not about religion or an organization, but a king and his kingdom. Therefore, in order to correctly understand, interpret, and apply these scriptures, knowledge of kingdom is necessary. The kingdom is the oldest of all forms of government and the only one that is of divine origin. God invented the kingdom concept and established it first in heaven. A kingdom is simply a domain over which a king has rulership. Heaven was the first domain that God created. Although invisible, it is very real place, even more real than what we call reality. 
The natural came from the supernatural. Therefore, the supernatural is always more real than the natural. Heaven is more real than earth. Even though we cannot see it with our physical eyes, in the beginning, God established a kingdom as the governmental system for ruling the supernatural realm of heaven. Once his kingdom was established in heaven, God desired to extend it to another realm. With this end in mind, the bigger picture, he created a visible physical universe with stars, the lights and the firmament, um, the sun and the moon. Earth was set up from the beginning to be colonized. He placed human beings created in his image to run the colony for him. In this way, God also established the first earthly kingdom, which is a extension of his kingdom in heaven. Through rebellion against the king, however, a man lost his rulership. We have been trying to get it back ever since. Even though we lost our earthly kingdom, we still retain the original kingdom idea that the king implanted in our spirit. We are searching for the kingdom all the time. But without God, we can never find it because it is from him. In our kingdom search through the ages, man has developed and experimented with many different systems of government, uh, such as I had talked about in the earlier newscasts. Every one of them, including those who call that a kingdom, are defective because mankind is defective. But they are all driven by our desire to regain and restore the original kingdom. This is not a utopian fantasy or some pie in the sky. In the beginning, God established utopia in heaven and then extended it to earth. Our utopian dreams are simply expressions of our yearning to regain the kingdom we had once lost. According to the colonial charter stated in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, man originally was given an earthly kingdom to rule over, which was perfect. Adam and Eve were the rulers, the overlords of this physical dominion, co-rulers who themselves were ruled by God, by Yahweh, their creator king. They were his people, and he was their God, and there was no intermediary rulership. Human kingdoms, which at best were but dim and flawed reflection of God's kingdom, had citizens who were also subject of the king, meaning they were subjects to the king. His personal ambitions, goals, whims, and desires. God's kingdom is different. In the kingdom of God, there are no subjects, only citizens, but every citizen is a king or queen in his or her own right. This is why the Bible refers to God as the king of kings. He is the high king of heaven who rules over the human kings he created in turn to rule over the earthly domain. Adam and Eve's rebellion cost them their kingdom. Genesis chapter 3 relates this tragic, sad story of how the human pair fell victim to the lies and deception of the serpent, which embodied the prince of darkness, that fallen angel known as Satan or Lucifer. With Adam and Eve's abdication, Lucifer seized control over their earthly domain as a brazen, arrogant, and illegal pretender to the throne. He usurped it in a coup d'etat. Immediately, the king of heaven put in motion his plan to restore what man had lost, and what did man lose? A kingdom. Adam and Eve did not lose religion because they never had a religion. They had a kingdom. So when God set out to restore what they had lost, he set out to restore a kingdom, not a religion. Religion is an invention of men, born of his efforts to find God and restore the kingdom on his own. But only God can restore the kingdom man lost. After the disaster in Eden, the king confronted his rebellious co-rulers and their deceiver and addressed each one in turn for their sins. Of greatest interest to us in this context is what the king said to the serpent because it has kingdom implications. Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. 
Referring to the woman's offspring by the singular pronoun he indicates that the king was speaking of one specific offspring, one who would strike a fatal blow against Lucifer and his schemes by crushing his head. As the rest of scripture makes abundantly clear, this one specific offspring appeared thousands of years later as the man Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We all know him as his Hebrew's name is Yeshua, and it's Hamashiach, which is the Messiah. He is the Son of God embodied in human flesh. When Yeshua appeared on the scene in real space-time history, he brought a message not of religion, new or old, but of the kingdom. Matthew 4, verse 17. From that time on, Yeshua began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Isn't it any wonder that these are the first recorded words of Jesus, of Yeshua? This is the beginning of his ministry. The phrase, that time, referred to the arrest of John the Baptist, a prophet whose mission was to announce the arrival of the king. Now the king himself was on the scene, and he was announcing the arrival of the kingdom. This was the only message Jesus preached. Search all four of the te New Testament Gospels, Math, Mark, Luke, and John, and you will find that Yeshua always talked about the kingdom. Everything he said and did related to the kingdom and its arrival on the earth. Yeshua said, repent, which means to change your mind, to stop doing your way, adopt his way of thinking, adopt God's way of thinking for the kingdom of heaven is near, which means in effect that it has arrived. In other words, Jesus was saying, change your way of thinking. The kingdom of heaven is here. I brought it with me. When Yeshua brought the kingdom of heaven to earth, he brought also the promise of restoring to mankind the dominion over the earth that Adam and Eve had lost in Eden. He brought back our rulership. Before we could be fully restored to our kingdom, however, the matter of our rebellion against God has to be dealt with. This rebellion is what the Bible calls sin, and it is universal in human nature. It's a legacy that Adam and Eve's treason in Eden had done to creation so long ago. Yeshua's death on the cross paid that price for our rebellion, so that we could be restored or redeemed from the earth to a right standing with God, our King, and be reinstalled in our original and rightful place as rulers of the earthly domain. The gospel message, the good news, is more than the cross. The cross is the doorway that gets us back into the kingdom. The cross of Christ, therefore, is all about kingdom restoration. It is about restoration of power and authority. It is about regaining rulership, not a religion. Why did God wait thousands of years from the promise in the Eden of the kingdom restoration to its realization with the coming of Yeshua? He had to allow the course of human history to flow until the timing was right in order for us to understand what we lost when we lost the kingdom, much less to understand kingdom principles, which we've lost. Folks, I don't know anyone in my lifetime except for someone that I would meet from England who would understand what a monarchy really is, how to live in a kingdom. What most people partly understand is that when Yahweh the Father in heaven sent his son Yeshua into the physical world with this message that the kingdom of heaven had arrived, what is his purpose in restoring this kingdom? It was not to only just give us um, a religion, basically, an order of laws and policies and procedures, statutes, judgments, you know, to follow and to become part of this civilization. Um, but it was to restore us, 
humanity back to our full rights as sons and daughters of the king. The king of heaven wants sons and daughters, not servants. I always get this a lot from people who don't understand religion um, and have not done the many years of research into the religions of the world to really understand that Yahweh, Yeshua, and Ruach HaKodesh want a relationship with us. They don't want another religion in the world um, because religion produces servants. It reveals, it revels, basically, in the spirit of servitude. Um, look at the Catholic priests. They get off on this. Like, truly, they do. Please don't is misunderstand me. A servant's heart is, as Jesus said, the key to greatness in the kingdom of God. That's in Matthew uh, chapter 20, verse 26 and 27. And he said that he himself came to serve rather than to be served, verse 28. But this kind of service should always proceed from the place of security in our knowledge that we are sons and daughters of the Most High and simply are following his example. Servanthood in the religious spirit, on the other hand, proceeds from a sense of false humility and self-deprecation, where one sees oneself not as a son or a daughter, but as a slave. Sons and daughters of the king see service as a privilege. Religion, religious people see it as an obligation. And therein lies the difference. Sons and daughters serve willingly because they are sons and daughters. They are loyal to their father. Religious people serve grudgingly because they feel that they have no other choice if they hope to win any approval or get any kind of limelight um, so don't cons don't ever confuse uh, serving with being a servant. Jesus came that we might receive the full rights of sons. This is a legal language. There is not a bit of religion in these words. There refers to legal rights and entitlements based on relationship of birth. We are sons and daughters of God. Sonship is our right by creation. Christ did not die to improve us. He died to regain, to redeem, and confirm us. The price he paid in his own blood was not to make us worthy, but to prove our worth. He did not come to earth to enlist an army of servants. He came to restore the king's sons and daughters to their rightful positions, rulership as heirs of his kingdom. If we are heirs and are destined to rule in our father's kingdom, then we had better learn to understand his kingdom and how it operates. We had better learn its principles and concepts. We must learn how to think, talk, and live like kingdom citizens. The kingdom is the most important message of our age, and this answers the dilemma of ancient and modern man. According to Yeshua, everyone is trying all they can do to find it and force their way through life to lay hold of it. Luke 16 and 16, since that time, the good news of the kingdom of God is being preached and everyone is forcing his way into it. Everyone over 6 billion people on the earth are searching for this kingdom. So where do you want to spend your eternity? In the lake of fire with the devil and his demons and false prophet? Or would you rather spend it with Yeshua HaMashiach learning about life and all the joys that can be had therein? Folks, I hope this message has blessed you. Please keep looking up. Our redemption draweth nigh. Every eye is going to see him in the clouds of heaven when he comes. And it's going to happen sooner than you believe, folks. Uh, things are happening now in the world. It is more important that you consider your allegiance today because we are not promised another day on this earth. 
Love you all so very much. Loves and hugs. Praying for you all. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. I love your emails at um, my Yahweh words only at protonmail.com in the description box below. And thank you very so sweetly for those who donate to this cause because it's helping me to build the website and to get this knowledge out there while we still have the light. So love you all. Yahweh bless and Maranatha everyone. He's coming.